Right, I think we'll probably get started and people can just join us as we go along. So thank you everybody for coming this evening. Although we're not in the flesh, it's great to, to have you all here virtually. Um, and it's really great to welcome Dr. Andrew Spencer back with us today. Um, Andrew Spencer is a senior tutor at Gumbel and Keys College at Cambridge, and he will be talking to us today about applying to Oxford or Cambridge. Um, what to expect through the process, what it's like to be a student and all those other things that I'm sure you want to know about. Um, please drop your questions in the Q&A at the bottom as we go along. We'll collate those throughout the talk and then we'll pass them on to Andrew at the end and I'll ask him all of those questions um, that, you, that you have put in there. Okay, so I think we'll get straight over to, to Andrew if that's okay. Great, thank you very much, Joy, and um, it's good to see everyone sort of virtually, uh, and it's good to be here virtually. I've, I've been coming to um, to St Peter's uh, in York for a number of years, um, but uh, this is the first time I, I'm coming to it from my um, from my spare room in in Huntingdon. So um, anyway, I will uh, hopefully it will it will still be useful to you and 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 enjoyable. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about applying to Oxford or Cambridge. It's worth pointing out just at the very start that um, it says Oxford or Cambridge. It doesn't say Oxbridge on there. Um, we tend to talk about Oxbridge and join Oxford and Cambridge together. There are lots of similarities between the uh, between the two universities and many of the things I will say tonight are relevant to both universities. Um, but there are differences um, between them, and I will try to bring some of those out in uh, the uh, in the course of the talk. Uh, and uh, one of the, the the first differences, or, or most important things to bear in mind at this stage, is you can't apply to both. Uh, you have to choose one or the other to apply to uh, in any particular year. Um, so let's kick off by asking the question: Well, why should you think about applying to either Oxford? or to Cambridge. Well, higher education is one of the things that we still do really well in this country. There are lots and lots of really good universities in this country. Uh, and wherever you are uh, in the world at the moment, if or wherever you are in the country at the moment, there is likely to be uh, a large number of very good universities within a short distance from you. Um, York being one of those, but Leeds not very far away in Yorkshire, Sheffield, another very good university in Yorkshire. There are lots of excellent universities in Yorkshire, um, but uh, Oxford and Cambridge, if you look at any league tables, both national and international, you will find them towards the top. If you look at the international league tables, you tend to find Oxford and Cambridge in at least one of them in the top five and nearly always both of them in the top 10 uh, in the world. Um, why is that? And that's because some of the reasons that are up there on the screen. Um, there is a broad range of courses uh, at Oxford and Cambridge, a somewhat smaller number of courses than you may find at many other universities because we tend to teach very broadly across academic subjects. We don't have very many vocational courses. There are a few, but, but uh, essentially we tend to teach academic subjects, um, uh, traditional academic subjects, uh, but uh, in a very broad and in a very deep way. World-class teaching. Um, lectures, seminars, classes, practicals, well you get those at any university. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge, uh, the, the teaching is delivered by, um, uh, by academics from all over the world, leaders in their field. Uh, the best universities in the world, the best universities in the UK are research-led institutes, research-led teaching. So what that means is that those who are teaching you are still at the cutting edge of research, producing new information, new ideas, um, new experiments, um, new vaccines um, to, uh, to improve the way that we think and interact with the world uh, and you as a student get to interact with them. Um, so as I say lectures, seminars, classes, practicals, you get those at any university. What you get that is unique to Oxford and Cambridge um, is the small group teaching on a regular basis uh, at undergraduate level. Um, they call them tutorials in Oxford, supervisions um, in Cambridge. Um, tutorials and supervisions are regular small group meetings with leaders in your field, where in the sciences you will work through problem sheets based upon the lectures that you've been going to, and in the humanities you will write essays weekly uh, and uh, will discuss those with your supervisor or with your tutor. Um, and 
what do we mean by small group? Well, in many subjects, it's one on one, one academic and you uh, in the room. Uh, in most subjects, it's two students uh, and uh, for some, uh, for some, the largest group that you would be in is, is four. Um, but this is a, a, a real opportunity for you to come face to face and question and ask and engage with uh, leaders in your field. And it's a very exciting part of uh, the learning experience. And it's something that you don't get anywhere else in the UK, anywhere else in Europe, anywhere else in the world, including the best North American universities. You do not get this level of individual attention uh, at undergraduate level. Excellent facilities and resources. Well, in order to be able to produce cutting edge research that, that leads Oxford and Cambridge to the top of, uh, of university league tables, you need to have really good facilities. So in the sciences, of course, that means lots and lots of bench space, of lab space. Um, and in the humanities, it means lots of libraries and really good libraries. And for both the sciences and the humanities, it means having lots of excellent online resources as well. And both universities have subscriptions to all sorts of different uh, online resources. Um, in terms of libraries, there are uh, every college will have its own library. Every faculty or department has its own library. The University Library in Cambridge, the Bodleian Library in Oxford are copyright libraries, which means they have a copy of every single book that's ever been published in the UK or in Ireland. And many, many, many thousands of books are published abroad. Uh, there are over eight million items in the University Library in Cambridge, a similar number in Oxford. Academic pastoral and financial support. We'll talk a bit more about that as we go through. Much of that is de is delivered by the colleges. We'll talk about what we mean by Cambridge and Oxford being um, collegiate universities shortly. Uh, wide range of extracurricular options. Um, Oxford and Cambridge are not large cities, um, but so it's not London or Manchester or Leeds, um, but they are cultural centres within the UK. A huge amount is going on uh, in them, much of it um, done by students themselves, um, but also people coming back to Oxford and Cambridge who were educated here before, but also people from all around the world uh, in all sorts of different disciplines, music, sport, drama, politics, um, the creative arts, will come to Oxford and Cambridge and talk, uh, and students can go and see them for free or for a very um, cheap cost. Um, so there is a huge amount going on every night um, in normal times, I should say. It's not a huge amount going on, obviously, um, uh, during uh, the pandemic, but um, but there's still a lot going on online during uh, during the pandemic. Um, excellent graduate opportunities, irrespective of degree discipline. That's an important thing to stress. You should choose the subject that you want to do. Very few careers. Uh, are specific to certain subjects. Obviously, if you want to become a doctor, you need to do a medicine degree. Uh, if you want to become an engineer, you need to have done engineering. Um, but for lots of other, most of other jobs, um, you don't need a specific degree to do them. What you need is skills. That's what employers are interested in. And studying at Oxford and Cambridge, studying at university in general, but it will give you skills uh, that will uh, enable you to uh, to be a good employee. One of the things I always say to my students um, is that, uh, you know, they may never use their, uh, the material from their essay on King Edward II, uh, which they've done with me ever again. But the skills that they've learned through doing that of uh, assessing huge amounts of information, working out arguments, uh, working out what, what uh, pieces of data are relevant and which aren't, and then producing it in a written form and then being able to discuss it uh, in, uh, in supervision. All of these are useful skills that employers are interested in. So I said a moment ago that Oxford and Cambridge are collegiate universities. What does that mean? Um, well, uh, it means that uh, you are simultaneously a member of the university, of your department, of your chosen subject and uh, of a college. There are uh, 29 undergraduate colleges in Cambridge, just over 30 or so in Oxford. Um, and every student is a member of a college, uh, a member of their department and a member of the university. So the way I, I usually try to sort of explain it is to say, well, it's a bit like the United States of America uh, in that the colleges are uh, like the individual states and the university is like the federal government. Um, and you are simultaneously uh, a citizen of Alabama uh, and a citizen of the United States. Uh, and that's a bit like how it works. Um, 
uh, I used to say I, I wasn't quite sure where Donald Trump fits into it, but fortunately that joke's now got too old. I can't use it anymore. I have to think of a different one. Um, anyway, uh, so how do you as a student interact with different parts of the uh, of the uh, of the collegiate university? So let's think about the university first of all. What does the university do, um, uh, and and the departments that make up? The university well they set the course content so regardless of which college you end up at you will be able to do uh, everything uh, that's available within the English course or that's available within the law course or the maths course um, there are no special uh, options only available for people from certain colleges so the university sets the course content for each uh, degree for each subject uh, it delivers the lectures, seminars, practicals and projects that we talked about uh, earlier in the university departments or in the big lecture halls uh, that can hold up to you know, 300 people for some of the um, you know, first year engineering or first year medicine uh, courses, uh, uh, lectures. The university sets the assessments uh, and the exams that's set by the university. So there are the same exams available for everybody to uh, to take. Obviously, you will not take the same exams as uh, as other people because you will have chosen different options, different uh, different uh, uh, papers, as we call them, within the course. But everything is available to you, and it's all set by the university. The university awards the degree, and also both universities have uh, uh, excellent careers departments that provide careers advice uh, for students when when they've left, but also while they are students. Um, at the same time in terms of helping them to get internships, preparing their safe CVs, helping them with interview techniques and things like that. What about colleges? What do they do? Well, colleges are, are like the sort of campus element. Um, it's where you live first and foremost. Um, but the first thing that colleges do is they admit students. So when you apply to the University of Oxford or you apply to the University of Cambridge, uh, you apply to a college. You can make what's called an open application, um, but then you are assigned to a college via a computer algorithm. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, you are then treated as if you'd apply to that college in the first place. So you apply to a college in order to study medicine or law or history or whatever it might be. Uh, and when you receive an offer, you receive an offer not from the University of Cambridge or the University of Oxford, but from a particular college. And it may be a different college from the one that you applied to. Both universities run a moderation system, which is known as the pool. Uh, and that um, evens out the fact that some colleges get more applications than others and reduces uh, uh, the, uh, the effect of college choice, which means that it doesn't matter which college you apply to, uh, your chances of entry to the university are uh, essentially the same um, because students get moved around and around about a quarter of all students end up at a different college to the one that they applied to initially through this moderation system through the pool. Um, so colleges provide academic and pastoral care so this is where they do it slightly differently uh, at Oxford from Cambridge. I'll tell you the Cambridge system and then I'll, I'll tell you the Oxford system. Um, so at Cambridge, when you arrive, you are assigned a, a director of studies. Your director of studies is a, an academic, uh, a, a member of your college, so, uh, 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 so is, is a fellow of your college, uh, and he or she is uh, in charge of your academic development during your time at the university. Um, and so they will almost certainly teach you at some point in the first couple of years. Uh, they will arrange your supervisions or your uh, or your uh, tutorials with, uh, with, with other academics and they'll get reports back from those academics. They will um, write references for you. They will uh, help you choose which papers, which, uh, which modules you want to take as you go through. Uh, and they will meet with you regularly, beginning and end of each term usually, and will give you a pat on the back or a kick up the backside, depending upon what you might need. Um, you are also at Cambridge assigned a tutor when you arrive, a personal tutor who is in charge of your pastoral care, i.e. your, um, your non-academic care. Um, and Joy introduced me, I'm uh, as the senior tutor. So uh, as senior tutor, I am in charge of the academic and pastoral care of, uh, uh, of, of the, the, the whole college. But beneath me are a number of tutors who provide the pastoral care. So I appoint the directors of studies and then I also appoint um, the tutors and they uh, provide 
the the pastoral care so that in that sense they can act as a liaison with your department so i, I remember i had a student a few years ago who fell off his bike on the uh, first day of his exams um and broke his arm couldn't take any exams uh, so i wrote to the department and said look this is what's happened he's a good student i sent them the supervision reports and they uh, they moved him through to the second year without him having to take any more exams uh, which was good for him because he was in quite a lot of pain um, but your tutor is also there to act uh, as to give you advice to help you navigate through the sometimes uh, Byzantine corridors of administration in the university and, and, and college to help point you in the direction of where you can get uh, financial support or uh, professional support. Um, but they're also there just to listen to you uh, and to uh, and to help you uh, with any problems that you might have. You can go and talk to your tutor and he or she will give you advice and point you in the direction of further professional advice, which the college will make available to you for free. Um, at Oxford, uh, you they combine the role of tutor and director of studies and they just call it tutor. So you, they do the, the one person does the same thing. Uh, but what this means in both in both uh, universities and both uh, sets of, of university is that uh, you have senior people in the college who know you by sight, know you by name, know what how your, your studies are going, know how your extracurricular things are going uh, and, and, and what you're up to, what you like. Uh, and so it's it is one of the ways in which we have an early warning system. We can identify problems early and intervene early. It's one of the reasons why Oxford and Cambridge have the lowest dropout rates of any university. Um, and I, I can tell you that uh, as a tutor, as a senior tutor, um, I spend a huge amount of my time every week dealing with um, the individual problems that students might have uh, and, and helping them through them. Um, and it is a, a, a hugely rewarding part of, of my job. Um, accommodation, dining and recreation. So colleges are where you live. So they give you somewhere to live. Uh, at Cambridge, you're guaranteed accommodation for uh, the duration of your undergraduate course. Uh, at Oxford, you're guaranteed at least two years. Most colleges will now guarantee you all the way through. Um, and uh, also, you have places to eat. So in hall, uh, that's what we call it, which is basically the cafeteria uh, and uh, recreation as well. So college offers you your first friendship group, essentially, um, your first uh, opportunity to meet friends, both in your year group uh, 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 colleges, lots of people studying lots of different subjects. Um, at, at Cambridge, the largest colleges admit about 180 students a year. The smallest ones about uh, 85 students a year. Um, across all subjects. In Oxford, it's a slightly smaller, um, their colleges are slightly smaller uh, and the smallest ones admit about 65 and the largest ones about 140. Um, and uh, what that means is that, you know, there are 180 or 150 or 100 students in your year who've arrived. So that automatically reduces the three and a half thousand new freshers that arrive to around about 120 or so, yeah. Um, but also within that, there are half a dozen or so people doing your subject in your college in your year. And so it offers you this, these sort of concentric circles, which you can build out your friendship groups um, from. And within colleges, there's a huge amount, again, of sport, music, drama, all sorts of other stuff going on that you can get engaged with um, and, uh, uh, and meet, meet people, make new friends, uh, etc. Um, so college off is often the starting point for your friendship and then students will make friends in their subjects at other colleges uh, through the, uh, the pastimes that they're interested in as well. Colleges organise small group teaching, so they organise the supervisions um, or the tutorials and they have facilities for academic study, Wi-Fi throughout the college, uh, uh, libraries uh, as well, many of which are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week during the uh, term time. So what are we looking for uh, in our students at Oxford and Cambridge? Academic ability and potential. Um, these are linked things, but they're not the same. Um, they are different. And one of the hard things about admissions is that you are essentially trying to identify potential. That's difficult. Um, and that you are um, uh, you're trying to 
predict the future. You're not just trying to admit the best students at 18, you're trying to admit those who are going to do the best at 21 and those who are going to go on and do really well afterwards to really benefit from uh, an Oxford or a Cambridge education. First thing you have to do is satisfy any subject requirements. So, uh, so check on the website as to which courses require which A-levels or which IBs uh, in order to do them. Some have no requirements whatsoever, um, others uh, have um, specific subjects that you have to have done in order to apply. Genuine subject interest, motivation and enthusiasm. Um, this is important. It doesn't mean that you have to spend every minute of the waking day uh, and the moment you wake up uh, or the last thing you think about when you go to sleep at night is, uh, is your subject. But what it means is that you've engaged with your subject outside of the classroom. And there are lots and lots and lots of ways to do that, um, even during, um, during lockdown. And in fact, especially during lockdown, because there's nothing else to do. Um, so you can go out and uh, onto onto the onto the uh, onto the internet and uh, download uh, podcasts, watch lectures, uh, participate in online competitions of uh, of uh, that are related to your subject. Uh, and so there's loads and loads of ways in which you can uh, you can engage with your subject outside the classroom, and that's what we want to see. A good fit between applicant and course. Don't just apply to Oxford and Cambridge because it's Oxford or Cambridge. Apply because we're offering you the right subject, the right course in the subject that you want to do. Um, so I'll give you an example, uh, medicine. Um, so many of you, I suspect, will be interested in becoming doctors. Um, and if you are, that's 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 great. Um, but there are different ways to become a doctor. Obviously, you learn the same content. Um, but you will learn it in different ways. So at many universities, the way they do medicine is uh, an integrated medicine course. You're meeting patients, you're doing problem-based learning right from the very start. You're in hospitals, you're meeting patients. That's not how we do medicine at Oxford and Cambridge. You don't go into hospitals properly until your fourth year. Um, you learn medical science first, and then we let you loose on patients. It's a very different way of doing things. Academic, academics first, becoming a doctor later. Um, it suits some people, it doesn't suit others. You need to think very carefully about whether that style of becoming a doctor suits you. Um, and, you know, it's similar in other courses as well. Look carefully at, the, at the, what we're offering um, before you apply. Vocational commitment where appropriate is really only uh, relevant for medicine and veterinary medicine, um, where you need to have done some work experience uh, in order to do it. Um, outside of that, um, work experience isn't really that important to us. Uh, and if you have done it, it's not simply, oh, well, I, I, I interned at a, uh, at a, um, at a, a local solicitor's, because all that really tells me is that your mother or father knows a, knows a solicitor. Um, it, it, uh, what I want to know is what you got out of it. You know, did you, you know, did you come across a particularly interesting legal case or when you were, uh, working at, um, uh, in, in the doctor's surgery, did a particularly interesting disease walk through the door, obviously attached to a patient. Um, I want to, and you went, then went away and learned more about it. That's what we're interested in. Uh, we will assess every application holistically. So we will look at every aspect of an application before we make a final decision. So the application process, how does it work? First of all, you choose your course. So I say that's the most important thing, choosing a course, making sure that you're applying for something that you really want to spend the next three or four years doing. Choose a college or make an open application. Um, admissions tests, um, they are, um, uh, or, or assessments. So Oxford have a, a large suite of tests. At Cambridge, there are some pre-interview assessments uh, in certain subjects, particularly large ones like natural sciences, medicine, um, engineering, economics, uh, etc. Um, check the registration deadline for all of those, with the exception of the BMAT for, for, for medicine, the deadline is the same as the UCAS deadline, 15th of October. Uh, the BMAT uh, registration uh, for, uh, is, uh, is the 1st of, of October. Um, the UCAS application is an early deadline, early deadline because we do what's called gathered field admissions at Cambridge and Oxford. We wait for all the applications to come in before we start making decisions. Uh, which is different from the way they do it at other universities where they will make your, a decision on your application individually um, whereas we it's a competition it's an academic competition we have to wait for everybody to apply before we start making decisions uh, so it's an early deadline the 15th of october um, it's easy to remember 
it's my wife's birthday um, and it's the same every year both the birthday and uh, and the deadline if you're applying to cambridge you have to apply uh, you have to fill in an additional form sorry about that uh, but it's called the saq the supplementary application questionnaire uh, and the deadline for that is the 22nd of october that gives us a little bit more information about you uh, than the ucas form does but it's not very onerous it doesn't take very long to fill in um, then uh, uh, you may be asked to submit the, some written work if you're applying for a, an arts or humanities subject uh, and or take uh, the admissions test or assessment uh, if it's a pre-interview uh, test or assessment. And they are usually held right at the end of October or the very beginning of November uh, in half term or, uh, or close to it. Um, and they are sat in your school. Um, the interviews take place in December uh, and the decision comes in early January. Um, around about one in five applicants have made an offer on average. That varies from um, course to course. Some courses have more applications um, per place than others, um, but that's about the average. So what information are we using to assess your application to decide um, between you? Your academic record. So as I said earlier, it, it's uh, admissions is about predicting the future and that's really difficult but one of the best indicators for future academic performance is past academic performance it's not perfect by any means students develop at different rates and different times and in different ways and that's where potential comes into it um, so you don't need a perfect suite of GCSEs a perfect suite of A levels in order to apply and have a chance um, but the better you do at A level, the better you do at GCSE, the more likely you are to get an offer uh, and the more likely you are to do well once you're admitted. As I say, it's not a perfect indicator by any means, but it is something that is very important. Personal statement, um, it tends to be more useful in the humanities than in the sciences uh, and probably less uh, important at Oxford and Cambridge than it is for your other universities. Um, so what I would say about your um, personal statement is to try to make it uh, your own. Um, talk about your interest in the subject, what got you interested in it in the first place, and how you've kept up that interest afterwards. Uh, how your other subjects combine with the subject you want to do at university. Um, how do they speak to each other academically? Um, don't... Um, don't just give me quotes about what other people have said about your subject. I don't care what they've said about your subject. I want to know what you think about it. Um, and don't lie on your um, personal statement because we interview you and we may well talk to you about it. Usually when students tell untruths, it's not deliberate. It's it's what I call an optimistic untruth. Um, they claim that they have read all of the, no the novels of Jane Austen uh, in October, um, fully intending to have got through to the end of them by December. Um, um, but in October, they've only just started Pride and Prejudice. Uh, and by December, they still haven't worked out that Mr. Wickham is a baddie. I'm sorry for the spoiler alert there. Um, uh, teacher's reference is very important. Um, so um, the school knows you a lot better than we do. So we take what they say about you very seriously. Um, and particularly if they're able to benchmark you uh, in comparison with other people in your year group or previous um, uh, students that they've seen and that they've come across. So, you know, uh, Jesse is the best physicist we've had in the last 15 years. Uh, Jamie is uh, is within the top 2% in the class, um, that sort of thing. Um, so um, that's that's uh, that can be very helpful for us. Performance in admissions test or assessment. Uh, I think it's it's worth saying that and it, here again, there's a difference between Oxford and Cambridge. The admissions uh, uh, test at Oxford is probably more important than the admissions assessment is at Cambridge. Um, not least because Oxford use their tests to shortlist for interview. We don't shortlist really. We we what's called deselect. So we cut out the bottom sort of 25 percent. Oxford pick the top 50 percent. Um, to interview uh, and the, 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 their test is a key part of doing that. Uh, there are other elements in it as well, but, but the test is important. Written work, that's useful. Often we will talk to you at uh, interview about that. Um, and again, we will assess the written work for its own quality too. Contextual data, we have a huge amount of contextual data on students. Um, on uh, personal data, so we know, for instance, if, you've do, if you're on free school, 
free school meals. Uh, we uh, know um, about your postcode, where you live, if lots of uh, young people tend to go on to university or if they don't tend to go on to university from your postcode. Uh, we know uh, information from the census about your about your postcode, so that's helpful for us too. Uh, we also know a lot of information about the school that you've come from and are able to sort of think, okay, how are you doing in, uh, in comparison with uh, with others within your school. So we want to see that you're doing really well within your educational environment. That's what's uh, important to us. Um, uh, and then the interview is uh, is the final part of uh, the jigsaw, but it's not the most important thing. It is uh, one further piece of information that we have about you. No part of an application is considered in isolation. We look at everything before we make a decision and we tend to spend around about four hours on each application if you get through to the interview stage, um, which is about um, four times as much as all of your other applications put together. Uh, at most other universities they'll spend 10-15 minutes on your application before they make a decision we spend around four hours. So I can't sit here and say hand on heart, we get it right every time we don't, we make mistakes every year. Um, we admit people that in the end we probably shouldn't have done uh, and we turn away lots and lots of people who would have done perfectly well had we admitted them. Um, but, um, but we try our best to make the best and fairest possible decision that we can given all the information that we have at the time at which we make it. So how can you prepare? prepare to apply, do your research, choose the right course. Course, most important decision that you can make. Do some research thoroughly, your personal interests. Um, engage and explore, go beyond the, uh, the curriculum, as I said earlier, uh, to engage in super curricular activity is what we call it. Um, results work as hard as you can to do as well as you can in your current studies uh, and practice. Um, practice uh, discussing your academic interests with your friends, with your parents, with your teachers, uh, with your um, your parents, friends, uh, with anyone that uh, who is uh, is willing to talk to you about your subject. The more you talk about it, the more confident you will feel uh, when you get uh, to talk about it at an interview. Um, past example admissions tests and assessment papers that they're, they're always useful to look at a to see what you know what what is the format you know how, how does what are they after what are they looking for um, but also timing um, the way in which a lot of students um, who who don't do well in the admissions assessments or tests is because they've run out of time uh, and they get zero answer zero marks for, for questions that haven't been answer, uh, answered uh, and time management comes into that, not just for those, but more generally, um, being able to prepare uh, is really, uh, uh, prepare well is important because you will need good time management when you're at Oxford or at Cambridge because you will be working very hard. Okay, uh, that is the end of my presentation. Um, so I'm going to stop talking now. I'll stop screen sharing as well. Uh, those are the uh, uh, the university's websites. You can have a look at those. There's a huge amount of information on there. Do please visit them uh, and uh, and find things out. I'll stop screen sharing now.